Grab your Bibles and go to Proverbs, the fourth chapter and the 23rd verse. Proverbs, the fourth chapter and the 23rd verse. I'm so grateful that God meets us here. I know he's everywhere, but I thank him for manifesting his presence in this place. For those of you who are just joining us, perhaps even for the first time, welcome. We're so glad you came. It is our custom and practice here that we stand for the reading of God's word. If you'll indulge us, it makes us feel at home, gives God glory, and might cause me to preach like I don't have good sense. Proverbs, the fourth chapter, and the 23rd verse. The Bible calls it the foolishness of preaching. Because to the rest of the world, it might seem crazy, frivolous, foolish. Some of them may even think it to be foul. But at the conclusion of the matter, the word of the Lord is life. It is our strength. It is our guidance. It is our lamp. It is our light. It is our, it is our everything. It is more necessary than the daily food that we consume to have the word of God. So anytime I'm able to unpack, unload, digest, ingest, to project the word of truth, I am so humbled and so honored uh, just to have the opportunity to preach God's word to you on today. To my global campus family, excuse me, I didn't greet you when I came, but the Holy Ghost was here. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us around the world every single week. I love you with the love of Jesus. You're so faithful, consistent, and diligent. There are thousands of you watching me right now every single week. There are more of you out there than even are gathered in this sanctuary. And so I don't want to ignore you, nor do I want to put beside myself or put down, rather, the magnitude of what you contribute to our worship experience. Thank you for being here every week, for praying. Some of you are still serving. Some of you are sowing. I am so grateful for each and every one of you every single week, and I want to make sure that you feel welcome in this place. Welcome the people that are joining us from around the world. Come on, just celebrate them and let them know we're glad they're here. We're grateful that they're here. God be the glory. Uh, also, um, this is Black History Month, and so uh, by all means, J Culture has released a new black history version of the sweatshirts. Remember that this is more than a piece of apparel. This is more than a garment. This is more than clothes. This is an evangelism tool. We always put on the back of it this QR code that people can scan. And if they scan it, they will be taken to a one minute message on, the sal on salvation and given an opportunity to connect with the ministry team here and also uh, to be a part of the movement that we are literally launching around the country called the Victory Lap. We are about to take a Victory Lap and have nights of victory every single territory that God will allow us to go to so that we can win one million souls to Jesus Christ. That is our goal. We are going to win one million souls to Jesus Christ. The theme for this year, very simply for us, is simply Jesus, period. You can be ghetto if you want to, period. It's Jesus, period. We've gotten away from the, the main thing. Church is about everything but him. Cue the lights. Cue the smoke machine. Change the LED wall to this. We shouting and y'all doing strobe lights. We caught up in all the trappings. But I wanted to simplify the message and re remind us that the real reason for all of this, it has nothing to do with all of the stuff. Do they have children's church? You didn't ask, you, I know what you ask, can he preach? How long does he preach? What's parking like? Is it a lot of people? Is he gonna sing my song? Is he physically present? Oh yeah, I know you. I know you for your works. You ask everything but the main thing, is anybody getting saved? Are any souls being won to Jesus Christ? Is there priority in their passion on evangelism or is it on something else? Are they, are they worshiping the pastor or are they worshiping Jesus? Come on here, church. Do they have a choir? Do they have a praise team? Can they sing? Do they have Jesus? Do you feel his presence? Is the glory in the room? The transformation's happening. Our minds being reset. Is the word helping folks? Come on, somebody. 
That's why I told my team and everybody, I said, this is going to be a movement. This is not a moment. This is not a moment. It's a movement. Because this movement is going to be able to project the main thing and hopefully reset everybody's expectation and their anticipation back to the main thing, which is to win souls to Jesus Christ. That's all we are here for. We're here for those who do not know him. There was a point, I'm not even in my sermon yet, I'm sorry, but I, I got to say it. There's a point that you're born physically. And then there's a point that you die physically. And then there's a point that you're born spiritually. But there will be no point that you die spiritually when you are born in Christ Jesus. Here's the risk that you run. Between the time that you're born and the time that you die, that is all you have to make a decision to receive Jesus as your Lord and your Savior. That is all you have. If you miss this window, you will eternally be separated from God. But if you simply confess with your mouth, believe in your heart, the Lord Jesus was raised from the dead. In this window that you have, this short window, and if you have not lived long enough to know, life is short. You blink and your kids are grown. If you have not received them in this window, you will be eternally separated. But if you do, he says, I'm going to give you everlasting life. Though you died here, you will not die again. You will live for eternity in heaven with me. The alternative is very simple. You will spend it in hell where there will be torment for all of eternity, weeping and gnashing of teeth. Why miss heaven when it costs you nothing? Jesus paid an incredible price for you to have it. I know this is weird and awkward, but we're going to be weird and awkward. God called us a peculiar people. We're about to be strange. Is he giving the invitation before the sermon? And he is. <laughs> and did today not tomorrow this is going to be your day I'm prepping your heart before I even get into it no 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 not yet I love my ministers boy them soldiers come on And is and is so this is what we're gonna do since my ministers was on point they were on the wall they were ready <laughs> this is what we're gonna do I'm gonna ask them to extend their hands towards you I'm gonna pray that God will condition your heart that when you receive this word today that it's not going to fall on unfertile ground that it won't fall on stony thorny rocky ground but that your heart will be tender towards him that you will receive his truth and that nothing, no distraction, no hindrance, no pain, no problems, no past will prevent you from going to your, your full promise. I'm going to pray for you right now. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we extend our hands towards the, the people that are watching us around the world and the people that are in this room, believing that you're the God that can, that will, that shall. Open their minds, open their hearts, open their, their, their understanding that they would experience you like they've never experienced you before and that you will get the glory out of their life. Lord, re remove all the blocks, the blockades, the hindrances. Remove the guilt. Remove the shame. Remove every obstacle that has prevented them from jumping in fully and giving you a yes. And let them know that today you sent them here. You caused them to stop and watch this today so that they would receive you. That you strategically ordered their steps so that they could hear this truth and accept you as their Lord and Savior. Push them into it today by the power of your Holy Spirit. Pull them by the grace and the mercy that you've already extended. And ultimately seal them in your precious blood which was shed on Calvary for us. It's in your name that we already claim the souls and the lives that will be saved and the people that will be changed. And let the redeemed of the Lord shout hallelujah. hallelujah. And somebody just praise God in advance for what we're expecting on today. Oh my God. 
Go to Proverbs, the fourth chapter, the 23rd verse right quick. That's all we're going to deal with for the moment. And then you can keep your Bibles or your devices handy because we will ultimately go to a couple more spaces and places. Go to Proverbs, the fourth chapter, and the 23rd verse. You know, I'm trying out a new microphone. And um, my sound engineer, Jabari, the lead sound engineer, he says, man, pastor, I put it on you. We're going to tape that thing down. I didn't know you was going to be a gymnast up there. <laughs> yeah. Don't let the 50 fool you. <laughs> Proverbs 4 and 23. When you found it, say amen. amen. Real simple. Today I'm going to help you get out your feelings. Look, look at your neighbor. Don't they look like they're in their feelings? Ask them, are you in your feelings? You ain't shouted one time. You ain't danced. You ain't lifted up a hand. You over here looking mad and angry and bitter. You look like you're sucking on lemons. Face all turned up. Sitting down talking about, oh, my feet hurt. Just all in your feelings. Tell them, get out your feelings. Oh, I know I'm in the suburbs because I heard all the polish in here. It's like, get out of your feelings. No, you got to put a little ghetto gangster stank on it. Get out your feelings. Oh, okay, let me, let me get, okay. This is a suburban lesson for those of you who are joining me from the hood around the globe. This is a suburban lesson. It's cho. I'm giving your hood license. You better walk with me. Tell them, get out your feelings. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Okay, some of you just are cringing. You just, oh my God. I have 12 degrees. Okay, this is just for you this one time. Get out of your feelings. <laughs> Proverbs, are you ready? It says, above all else. Say that with me, above all else. Don't miss it. Above all else. This is what it says. Guard your heart. Guard your heart. Some of y'all are so careless with your heart, you treat it like it's nothing. You give it to anybody and everything. Somebody smile at you, wink at you, nice to you just for a minute, and you give them your whole heart. Ooh, this is going to be something different today. I feel it. Above all else, guard your heart. This is what it says after that. For everything you do flows from that. Out of the abundance of the heart, guess what? Your mouth speaks. And your, your heart and your mind are inextricably tied to each other. They cannot deny one another. Because as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. You will become what you think. You will become what you feel. And so that's why the scripture says, guard your heart. God, give me preaching power. Speak to us and help us to get out of our feelings and to get into you. Let us put feelings aside and let us embrace faith and walk with confidence in this journey that you have assigned for us with the joy of knowing that you did not give us this assignment and not equip us for it. Thank you in advance. Kill our ignorance with your truth. Cause us to hear clearly so that we might do what you've assigned. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the redeemed shout hallelujah, hallelujah. and amen. amen. You may be seated in the incredible presence of our magnificent God. Oh my God. Get out your feelings. Ooh-wee. Let me first, I have to first start and begin by making sure that remember this, the theme for this year is Jesus, period. So everything that I'm preaching, I'm preaching from the context or from the life or from the experiences, the practices, and even the promises and the precepts, which means that the directions and directives that Jesus has given. Because I want us to know, not know of Jesus, but I want us to know our Savior. There are too many people who know church. Oh, you know church. You know worship. You know of Jesus but you really don't know Jesus. How do I know? Because you're still running and ducking and hiding. 
People start asking tough questions or want to have tough conversations and you no longer want to be a participant because you don't know enough about them and you don't feel confident in what you know. The Jehovah's Witnesses can come to your door. I'm going to drop it. I ain't going to push it. I would venture to say that most of you will not open the door. As a matter of fact, turn the lights on, close the windows. And a lot of that is not because we don't want to be bothered, but a lot of that is because we don't feel equipped and armed. We know of him, but we do not know him. Are you with me? Yeah. So I wanted to make sure that you understood in this month that Jesus was an emotional guy. That he was not some mythical being, some existing phenomenon that did not have the sensation of emotion. Jesus was God incarnate. In other words, he was God come into earth, put in flesh so that he could feel and model for us everything that we needed to know about how to manage, handle, and even tackle our emotions. Jesus was an emotional guy and he felt. In, in Matthew 9 and 36, he felt compassion. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were being harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. That's what the scripture says. And, and I know we have this real docile, soft-spirited understanding of Jesus was just this meek and mild. He's a lamb. But Jesus got angry too. Yeah, don't play with him here. Don't push me. I'm too close to the edge. I'm trying not to. I'm just glad to know my crowd is here. Matthew 21, 12 and 13, it says Jesus entered the temple and he was mad because they were turning his daddy's house into a den of thieves. He flipped over tables and turned over chairs where they were selling pigeons and taking advantage of the people. Jesus got angry. He says, it's cool if you're angry, just sin not. Jesus actually experienced sadness and grief when he stepped to the tomb of Lazarus in John 11 and 35. There's the shortest scripture in the Bible. Jesus wept. Because he was sad and, and he was grieving both the, the lack of faith and confidence in him from the people, but also the loss of whom he knew as a friend. Jesus experienced joy in Luke 10 and 21. In the same hour, he rejoiced in the Holy Spirit and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to the little children. Yes, Father, for such is your gracious will. In other words, I'm excited that you have set this thing up this way. He had joy. Jesus experienced sorrow in the Garden of Gethsemane. Then he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful, even to the point of death. Matthew 26, 38 and 39. In Mark 10 and 14, he experienced indignation. In other words, he had sympathy and empathy and he had uh, uh, anger and frustration on behalf of innocent people. He had righteous indignation in Mark 10 and 4, 14. They were bringing the children and they were trying to stop them from bringing the children to Jesus. And Jesus says, I rebuke you. He says, get the, he says, he says, suffer the little children to come unto me for such belongs the kingdom of God. In other words, stop telling the babies they can't come to me. He experienced love. He felt love. John 13, 34 and 35, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. He was frustrated. He didn't have traffic and things to cut him off and cause him to feel the frustration you feel, but he was frustrated nonetheless. He was frustrated in Mark 9 and 19. He says, oh, faithless generation, how long do I have to be here to convince you that I am the way, the truth, and the life, that I am the provider, sustainer, protector, that I am able to do through my Father and that my Father and I are one? How long do I have to be here and you be faithless? In other words, how much do I have to show you before you start to believe I'm God? He was frustrated. He was weary in John 4 and 6. Jesus was tired from his journey, and the Bible says that he sat down by the well in Samaria. Not only that, he was distressed. You're not the only one that felt distressed or feels distressed. In Luke 12 and 50, he, he, Jesus expressed his impending distress about the forthcoming crucifixion. He says, I have a baptism to be baptized with, and how great is my distress until it is accomplished. With anguish and agony, he looked towards what was about to happen, and he was in distress. 
The Bible says that he cried and that he, he sweat blood uh, from his, 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 his brow. That that's how much anguish and distress he had over the fact that he was about to be crucified. Here's the thing though, Jesus experienced all of these emotions and yet the scripture says he knew not sin. Oh, y'all missed it. It means that he felt all of these things and was still able to manage his emotions and not fall into flesh and sin. Uh, okay, you didn't get it. It means that he never cussed anybody out. I got to speak your language. He never got mad at the counter and threw something at someone frivolously and harmed them with his insults and his words. And he never lost himself in his emotions and said, I'm sorry, I was just upset. Ooh, I'm preaching better than y'all saying amen. Preach, boy. How was he able to manage and master his emotions? He felt all of these things, but his feelings did not squelch or put away or put aside or diminish or get rid of or destroy his faith. He still had confidence in himself and he still had confidence in his father, which is God. How was he able not to ever lose his cool to the point that he would fall into sin and react in a way that was dishonorable or displeasing to God? This needs to be a question that you ask yourself. Because every now and then you will fall into feelings. And when you get in your feelings, the last thing you want to do is get rid of your faith. Some of you are trading your feelings for your faith and then you end up hurt and harmed and can't understand why you lost it the way you did. You got to learn how to master your feelings or your feelings will master you. Your feelings will have you in the wrong place at the wrong time with the wrong person or the wrong people. Ooh, don't make me do it. Don't make me do it. Y'all better say amen so I move on. Okay. How? How was Jesus able to still be productive, still be forgiving, still be, get, get beyond uh, betrayal, still deal with discouragement, still deal with distress and weariness and grief and anger, yet keep his emotions in check instead of letting his feelings destroy his future? You know how many people are in prison because of their feelings? You know how many people are divorced because of their feelings? You know how many people are falling away from the faith and they're going through the consequence of their choices because of their feelings? Feelings are a setup for a setback for the enemy, from the enemy. Let me tell you how he did it, real simple. It's not deep, it's not hard. Well, it's a little harder than you think because <laughs> without him, you won't be able to do this. This is how he did it because he guarded his heart. Above all else, guard your heart. For everything you do, everything you do, every, how you respond, how you react, what you accept, what you allow, what you experience, what you allow to be experienced in your circumstance, your setting, your circle, in your space, everything you do will flow from your heart. The word in the Greek, the word in the Hebrew, rather, mishmar, refers to the act of guarding someone closely. It would be the equivalent of having an officer that was guarding or keeping watch over a prisoner. The phrase translated uh, uh, with all diligence is mikol mishmar, which literally means more than anything might be guarded. He says, guard or stand watch over or protect or be vigilant as a armed guard guarding a prisoner, be as vigilant as that guarding your heart. And the real key there is above anything more than anything that might be guarded. It's crazy because we guard our, our pockets more than we guard our heart. <laughs> 
Somebody start asking you for money, you shut down. But if they ask you for ministry, I'm going to leave it right there. Don't make me push it. You, all, you, you down for a good time. You let them in. It's like, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm your best friend. Tell me all your secrets. As a matter of fact, you don't even, they don't even have to ask you. You just tell it on social media. You got all your business on Facebook, on Instagram, Snapchat, TikTok. All your business. Everybody know your family is fighting with each other. Oh, help us, Jesus. God says you're, you're, you're not guarding your heart. You're not positioning yourself so that people don't have access to what's happening on the inside. Are y'all with me so far? Plainly put, this verse commands us to watch over our heart more than anything else. That's it. But this is why you need to guard your heart. Here's this. Two things that, that are derivative of this. First, your hearts have a significant impact on your relationship to God. If you don't guard your heart, it's going to affect how you relate to God. And the condition of your heart can either draw you closer to God or push you away from God. You've been so hurt that you didn't even want to show up to church. What? There's a word coming forth that can help you liberate your thinking, get you out of the funk that you're in, but you stay away from it because you're in your feelings. Or on the opposite side of it, if your heart is hurt, if your heart is wounded and you realize that God is the way, Jesus is the answer, then it might push you closer to him. So the second reason that we guard our heart is because it also helps and affects how we relate to each other. It impacts your relationships with other people. It can draw you close to other people or it can estrange, estrange, estrange you to other people because you have not protected or guarded your heart. So how does the enemy get to your heart? Five gates. Here it is. Get ready. Five gates. Remember that you got to have a soldier guarding the gates of your heart. Because without a soldier guarding the gates of your heart, you expose that or offer that as a way in and the enemy can do whatever he needs to do to pull you away from God and keep you from each other. Why is this such a priority for him? Well, because the first commandment is to love the Lord your God with all of your heart. And the second is like it, which is to love your neighbor. So if he can keep you apart from each other and you apart from God, he has defeated you. In his mind, he feels, I have conquered them. They belong to me now. And you're falling into the trap because you're not guarding the gates. There's first of all the eye gate. It's highly deceiving. You see one thing, but it's not what you see with your eyes. That's why you have to learn to have discernment or watch with your spiritual eye. Even closer than you do your physical eye. Okay, let me help you out. Just because it looks good. Let me let that sit. Let me let that marinate just for a few seconds right there. Just because it looks good doesn't mean it's, oh my God. Oh. What's her name? Her name is Poison. <laughs> Woo! Uh-oh. What kind of car he driving? Oh, my gosh. Where you work? I'm going to get fluid out? Mmm. Ma, 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 ma. Girl, he fly me out to Miami. Uh -huh. Girl, he flying you to hell. And I ain't talking about the Miami heat. Eye gate. Ear gate is the first point of attack. Typically, the first thing is suggestion. Remember, the only power that the enemy has over you is suggestion. 
And when he suggests something, he gets into your ear gate and starts suggesting that, that things should be this or you hearing and listening to. That's why I preached a whole series, a whole sermon rather on music. That what has happened to the music. Because your ear gate is painting pictures in you, your mind that are causing your heart to stray far from God. Before you know it, you over here twerking like you are 12 or 20. The crazy and the scariest thing is now I see the babies doing it at two. I know you've seen it too. All of this starts with the ear gate, the eye gate, the second one, or the second and the third and fourth one are the mouth gate and the feel gate. These are the most weakly guarded. We don't guard our mouths, we say whatever we want to say. Please understand that when you say it on social media, you still said it. Just because you're hidden under the shroud of secrecy and anonymity, you think that you can say what you want to say. No, no, you got to guard your mouth because it is, your tongue is wicked. And if you start allowing wicked things to come out of your mouth, where is it coming from? I didn't really mean what I said. Yes, you did. Oh, you meant every bit of what you said. You may not mean it now, but you definitely meant it then. And you said it because you did not guard your heart. And then there's the nose gate. We don't hear a lot of talk about that. But you got to even be careful about that because certain scents will bring back memories. Get rid of all the spiritual connect connections and ties. Everything, I'm going to help you right here. Everything they gave you, get rid of it. He gave me a mink coat. And every time you smell it, brings you back to every place that he took you with it. <laughs> Ooh, this is going to be a rough ride this month. This is what's going to mess you up right here. I'm turning the corner. I don't want you to miss this. You got, a, you got these gates towards your heart. But you can, they can never, those gates can never be opened nor forced from the outside. They are always opened from the inside. Did nobody pick the lock to get your heart? You let them in. Nobody forced you to watch it. Nobody forced you to listen. Nobody forced you to feel it. You let those experiences in. And so your gate's vulnerability is because of your willingness to open up or leave them unguarded. I just fell into love with them. I don't know how, I just, it just happened. James, no, it didn't just happen, you happened. You gotta take ownership and responsibility. You opened the door. You knew what he wanted when he called you at midnight. You knew. What you doing? What, what, you, what you on tonight? Come, come. Can I, can I, let me, let me stop through. I just want to holler at you for a minute. It's so late. You want to come now? You in the bathroom like this right here. You coming right now? You still coming? What time you gonna get here? Y'all ain't ready? You gonna get out your feelings today? Oh, I'm gonna yank you out of it in the name of Jesus Christ today. You ain't slick. Did he just do that? And did. Okay. <laughs> Put James 1 and 14 on the screen so everybody can see it. But every man is tempted. No, no, no. Watch this. Let me help you out. Let's go, we're going to read it in part because I want to exegete this for you. But for every man is tempted. That means you. And, and man here is representative of mankind. 
So I don't want you to just say, man, yeah, see these men, they ain't nothing. No, no. Every woe man is tempted too. Come on here, somebody. I, I know how y'all talk. I had a big sister growing up. Y'all nasty. And I'm sitting there like this. Every man is tempted. Please tell your neighbor he is talking about you. When I first started, I was just talking about this the other night. <laughs> when I first started in the music, I was in Arkansas. This is before I was in the music business. This was just me being, a, a, I had a community choir. And, and my wife, we were just dating. We, we weren't married at the time. But my wife would come to the church every single rehearsal. And she would just sit there. Just every single rehearsal, she was going to be there. And so I was just like, well, man, you know, you know she was hanging out with her boo. She, you know, she won't see, she watch me do what I do. You know, I'm, tur I'm, tur I'm turned around. You know, I'm directing the choir like this here. You see me? So the problem is, the problem is, she kept on coming and kept on coming and kept on coming. Every rehearsal she was there. So one day I'm like, you know, you know, you know, babe, I love you. You ain't, you ain't got to come to all the rehearsals. It's okay. She said, mm mm. I wish I had a chair so I could show you how she sat. She said, mm-mm, and then she just crossed the little leg. She says, no, my presence will get rid of some stuff. <laughs> and all the sisters said, Every man, every woman is tempted, watch this, when he is drawn away, don't miss this, of his own lust. So the enemy only tempts you with what you like. The only reason you fell into it, the only reason your gates became unguarded is because he dangled in front of you what you like. You like what this looks like. You like what this smells like. You like what this feels like. You like what they're saying. You like what you see. And oh my God, what he said. You gonna do what? For me? And for my children? So there has to be a gatekeeper. Let me tell you what the gatekeeper, who the gatekeeper is or what the gatekeeper is. It is godly fear. In Deuteronomy 6 and 13, it says, Thou shalt fear the Lord thy God and serve him and shall swear by his name. The problem is you let godly fear go away. The moment godly fear was removed, your gate was wide open. Let me explain it to you. You didn't fear God. In other words, you didn't have faith in God. You didn't trust God or you didn't take God at his word. And you outweighed God's consequence with what you were going to benefit in the moment. You said to yourself, self, it's not going to be that bad. And you allowed yourself to put godly fear, a fear of the Lord, a reverence and honoring of his word and his truth, his, and an obedience to him. You let that be squelched by what you were going to feel in that moment. In other words, you open the gate and you let yourself get in your Feelings. Who in hell left the gate open? In most cases, either you or in the situation of a child, the parents have left some gates unguarded. And this was because there is an absence of godly fear. There's no more reverence for the things of God, the teaching of God, the word of God, the truth of God, God's house. Now we do whatever we want to do, however we want to do it. We treat God any kind of way. He's, a, he's, a, he's an option and not a priority. 
you have put your own passions over his promises. You've allowed yourself to be pulled out into your feelings and now God is secondary. Why do I say that? Because you're allowing this person to pull you into things that you already know in your mind, feel in your spirit that conviction has set in and now you're operating outside of God's will. You're walking in disobedience and now godly fear has gone and you're in your feelings. The problem is your feelings are killing your faith. And as long as your feelings are killing your faith, you lose the ability, watch this, to please God. Yeah. Hebrews 11 and 6 says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. He that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. It's impossible for you to seek him and seek him at the same time. Let me drop it. <laughs> seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And he says, I'll bring everything that you need. I'll add it into your life. <laughs> See, first, are you with me? Yeah. And so how was Jesus able to master this guardianship of his own heart, protect his heart so that his emotions and his feelings would not cancel his faith? How was he able to do this? Here's a, here's a few steps right quick. I'm gonna drop these on you. First of all, you've got to learn how to be aware. You must understand your feelings. The problem is you, have, you can't master what you don't understand. He says, in all you're getting, get a what? Understanding. In all of your getting, you're getting all of these things and all of this benefit and all this good. And all, but you need to first and foremost make sure you have an understanding. Be aware, be aware. Unless there is some psychological disconnect, some level of disorder or a damaged sensory perception, all humans have the ability to feel. This is, this is, I don't want you to think that feelings are bad. All feelings are bad. No, God gave you these feelings. That's why Jesus felt all of these things. But he also gives you his rules, his guidance, his teaching, his training, so that your feelings do not get in the way of his promise for your life. Why do I feel? Why do you have these feelings? Let me help you understand your feelings. You got to be aware. If you're not aware, then the enemy can easily trick you. You can easily be trapped because you don't understand why you feel the way you feel or what feelings you even feel. First of all, he, he gave you feelings so you would have a connection with God. Emotions can be seen as a way to express love and gratitude and thanks and worship God. You, you have feelings for moral and spiritual growth. Because of conviction, you now go closer to God. You know I ain't right. This ain't okay. So it's going to have to pull me closer to God. If you didn't feel conviction, you would never go to the place that you're supposed to be. Empathy and compassion. Emotions can motivate uh, individuals to serve and help other people. To have reflections of God's image because God, through Christ Jesus, feels. Even God himself felt he felt love. He felt compassion to allow his son to come. He felt anger. He wanted to wipe out the whole nation. And Moses said, please don't kill him. Because if you kill him, they're going to say that you're a cruel God. It's so that we can have relationships with other people. That is an important thing to God. That's why he said, make sure that you love one another as I have loved you. He says, love your neighbor as you love yourself. Well, then he says, serve one another. The greatest among you will be servant of all. He says, if you want to do something, do the least for the least of these. If you do something for the least of these, you've also done that to me. Over and over and over and over again in the scripture, Jesus keeps saying, I need you to take care of each other. I need you to have a relationship with each other without feelings that would not be possible. Feelings are for coping and healing. Many people have turned, they turn to their faith and experience emotional hope and comfort. That is a good feeling. So I don't want you to think that all feelings are bad or that it's a bad thing and nobody, you should not have, you shouldn't be able to feel. No, you should feel. But there's a difference between emotions and truth. You have to understand feelings. Emotions are subjective. Truth is objective. E emotions are changeable, but truth never changes. The greatest difference is, is that emotions can deceive you. 
but God's truth will stabilize and ordain your steps so that you are not deceived and you actually can see. Satan uses emotions to manipulate you and lead you away from God's truth. You did it because you felt good and you didn't think you would get caught. That's how y'all going to act? You don't want to tell on yourself? If you can't say amen, just say ouch. You, 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 but, but understand, it was Satan pulling you away from God's truth. And here's the thing. Nobody crumbles in a day. It was a slow Until you finally looked, you felt the conviction and you said, I really need to go back. You look back and say, oh my God, I'm so far. How did I get, how did? Nobody's. See, this is why you need discernment and the wisdom of God. This is why you need the truth of God. This is why you got to hide the word in your heart that you might not sin against him. This is why you have to study day and night and meditate on it and really ingest it and make it make sense to you and allow the Holy Spirit to unlock and unpack it because if you don't, the enemy will pull you further and further away from God until you lost yourself. Have there ever been any moments in your life where you had to look around and say, how in the world, why, what was I thinking? How did I lose myself? I know God. So emotions are powerful motivators, but if they're handled with care. If not managed, if you do not learn to manage these emotions, they will consume and even kill your potential. You will be decades down the street trying to figure out how to go back and relive a time and a season that has passed. Ooh, I'm preaching good right now. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Please understand, you do not, the, the most precious commodity that you have is your time. I do not have any time to waste trying to figure out how to appease and please my flesh at the expense of my relationship with God. I got too much stuff to do and too many things, forgetting the things which were behind me. The foolishness of my youth, looking forward to the things which are before me. I will press toward the mark of the high calling which is in Christ Jesus. So you must, if you're gonna, if you're gonna re really be able to guard your heart, if you're gonna be able to manage and master your feelings, you've got to be aware of your feelings. The second thing is you gotta beware of your feelings. Okay, you, you missed it, let me do it again. The first one is to be aware. The second one is you gotta drop the letter and put the space out of it. Beware of your feelings. The danger of staying in your feelings is first of all, denied growth. If you are so caught up in your feelings that you no longer are able to move, that's called bondage. When an emotion has you in fear or denies you the right to grow, that is bondage. That is not love, that is fear. And that fear has you in bondage. I'm afraid to make a mistake because I know it's going to be explosive that's called bondage when you cannot expand your capacity for fear of emotional backlash or the toll emotions will take on you you are living in bondage and he whom the Sun sets free is free indeed and the worst part about it is you are the only one who can open the gate which means that you're also the only one that can close the gate. Let me help you out. This is gonna help you come out of this bondage. Some of you, I, God gave me this, it's a prophetic word I wanna speak in. I, I hear the Lord saying, 
Change your phone number. Thank you, Lord. Another thing that you need to be aware of is distorted perspective. Denied growth, distorted perspective because emotions can cloud your judgment and create false realities. You see what you don't see and you don't see what you need to see. What you felt was an indicator to what he or she is. But your own desires have created a beautiful outcome in your mind and clouded your entire perspective. In other words, you keep living in wishful thinking, but the reality is taking you further and further down and away from God. 1 John 4 and 18 says, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. The other thing that it can do to distort your perspective is you're fighting someone or something that hasn't even entered the ring. You, you, just, you just mad. What, 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 what's wrong? I don't know. You, you stressed out. You create a whole scenario in your mind. Oh my God, what if this happens? And what if that happens? And what if this, oh my God, what if this, oh my God, what if this, oh my You know the movies where they just slap somebody, don't you just feel like you said, wake up. You ain't even been to the doctor yet. Your whole perspective is distorted. You, you already crying over something. Ain't nobody dead. Oh my God, I had this pain on the left side. They said the left side. If I get the, I Googled it. I saw it on chat GPT on my left side. It means this. Oh my God, you gonna take my blanket. I'm gonna get in my, my shoe. My, these my favorite shoes. Make sure so-and-so get these shoes. And, and then who gonna get my plants? You gotta take care of my plants. You gotta talk to my plants and make sure you already divvying up your stuff and you got, you got a pain on the left side and you ain't even been to the doctor. It's gas. You got acid reflux. They're going to give you a pill. And you will live and not die. But because you're in your feelings, you didn't guard your gates with truth and with the fear of the Lord. And so now all of this says, no, 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 no. See, I, when that happens, you got to take captive every vain imagination that exalts itself against your knowledge of who God already is. And how do I do that? By speaking truth to my feelings, not letting my feelings speak and declare my truth. Are you with me? So I will say, I am healed in Jesus' name. I plead the blood of Jesus over my left side. Father God, in the name of Jesus, I decree and declare over myself that every vessel every blood vessel, every organism, every tissue, every molecule, every cell, it will come into alignment with your word which says you are wounded for my transgression, bruised for my iniquity, the chastisement of my peace is upon him and by your stripes, God, I'm already healed. It's already done. Yes, God, it's already done. What if the economy, what if the bottom falls out? What if I lose my job? What am I going to do? And my God shall supply. It's already done. You've allowed the enemy through your feelings to distort your perspective. And instead of you seeing who God is, you're now looking at your, what your situation is. The other thing that, that, that other, other thing that you need to be aware of is detached relationships. You get so far in your feelings and you uncheck your emotions and you damage good relationships. Because you're in your feelings. A friend of mine, I hope he doesn't mind me telling you, I won't call his name, but a friend of mine decided one day that in his own feelings, he was offended with me, but instead of talking to me about it, instead of being honest and candid and expressing his feelings, he just decided, I'm done with you. One challenge, he was on my payroll. So, you done with me? (laughs) 
I'm done with you too. I loved him the entire way. I said, hey, I said the most gracious, nice, loving. As a matter of fact, I sent it to my mama. I sent it to my daddy. I sent it to my pastor. I let my wife read it because I wanted to make sure that there was no me in it. I didn't want to be in my feelings. So in order to check my own self, I made sure that I put some barriers and some, some screens in place to make sure that I wasn't in my feelings, but I was in faith. And I was speaking according to the word of God, and I was speaking according to truth, and I was speaking according to what God would desire of me as a believer. And so I, I was this most loving, and I wish you well, I love you, and you know, God bless you, and bye. It's already done. Watch this. Fast forward three years. Two or three years. I don't remember. Two, three, two years, three years. Three years. I'm going to say three years. Fast forward three years, I get a phone call. Hey, just thinking about you. I said, you're wise. <laughs> now, if I was in my feelings, you know how you are? Oh, now you want to talk to me. I said, hey, love you, man. God bless you. I hope all is well. Everybody good? Everybody good? That's great. You know, let's get together. We got together. We sat down. We reconciled. You know, he's like, man, I'm sorry, man. I just, I said, no, it's no problem, man. Just loved him and you know, loved him. It's all good. We good. Everything is great. And then later on, another one of my friends was acting a fool. And this friend said, hey, let me tell you before you do this. You need to get out your feelings. Because the worst thing, he said, by 10 minutes after I sent that text, I felt the conviction and that I had been a little, hate. Maybe, maybe I was a little hasty. Maybe I, shouldn't have, maybe I shouldn't have been in my feelings and canceled a real friendship and ruined a real relationship, a covenant bond, because I had a moment of my feelings. And so even now, he is admonishing other people like, please get out your fit. Don't do that. Because he said it was the worst three years of his life. God will take you through consequence to train you and coach you up to the character that he desires you to have. So you must be aware of your feelings. Lastly, be free. Colossians 3 and 8. But now you must get rid of, you must rid yourselves of all such things like anger, rage, malice, uh-oh, slander, uh-oh and filthy language from your lips. I ain't say this in the book. You, 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 you mean me cussing somebody out or speaking a different language to them <laughs> is hindering my own freedom? Yes, because if they can get you that angry who has that level of control over your emotions? Who has that much authority over your feelings that you lose yourself, get in your feelings, and end up being disrespectful and disobedient to God? Blessings and curses can't come out of the same mouth. Okay. Freedom. How do I get free? This is your work. I did my part. Here's your work. First thing you need to do is have self-awareness. When my kids were younger, my wife would say all the time, use your words. In other words, we didn't do baby talk. We talked on a level that they would get an understanding. So you need to understand your words. You have to be aware of how you feel and be able to articulate and communicate your feelings. It's amazing that we always think that babies are the ones that can't communicate their feelings. No, grown people don't know how to talk about feelings. Especially if you were in the millennial, uh, if you were in rather the, the Gen X and the boomers and, and the silent age group. We didn't talk about feelings. Feelings? We don't cry. Straighten your face up. You, 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 beating, you beating me. I, 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 I can't straighten my face up. It hurts. Put your hand down. Huh? We don't talk about feelings. It was crazy because my daddy's I love you was, 
Go on, boy. That was, I love you. Now, he would tell the whole congregation, oh, I love my boys, my boys. I mean, he would celebrate and sing our praises, but he would never say it to me. So when I was an adult, living here in Chicago, first moved up here, I called my mama. She was at work. I said, mama, is daddy okay? What's going on? Is he sick? What's wrong? What's really happening? She said, nothing, boy. Why? I said, because he called me and said he loves me. He just out of the blue just called. He just out of the blue just called me. Mama just said, son, I just want to tell you I'm so proud of you and I love you. So I said, do I need to fly home? <laughs> because his generation and beyond, they weren't taught to communicate, articulate, or even deal with emotions or feelings. Therapy? What's that? Boy, you ain't crazy. Oh, I'm preaching to black people right now. Excuse me, everybody else, for one second. It's Black History Month. You need to know what are your triggers? What are your emotions? What are you feeling? What do you feel? What do you feel? I don't know. I just, I'm just, I don't like it. Well, what do you feel? I don't know. I just, you know, this ain't right, man. This ain't, what do you feel? You can't manage what you have not identified. And you don't have vocabulary to even articulate what you really feel. This is what therapy helps you with. It gives you a vocabulary to use so that you can even have healthy conversations about your feelings. My best conversations have happened in my adulthood when I was able to sit down with my mother and my father and talk about how things made me feel. That's what creates healthy children and healthy grandchildren and a non-toxic culture in your life. That's why when people, uh, let me just talk about extended family. When people in the extended family don't want to take, a benefit, take the benefit of discussing and dealing with feelings in a healthy way, they get blocked. Because I've learned a better way. And I've learned how to get out my feelings. So, so please under, text me right now. Take your phones out. Text me right now. Come on, I'm almost done. Come on, take your phones out. Come on, text me. <laughs> you at home too. Text me. Here it is. Text me. You already been on your phone the whole time. I've been watching you. You done checked everything. TikTok, Twitter. Checked your email. You done made your reservations for brunch. Come on, I saw you. Take it out, text me, here we go. Text me this at this number, 844. We even accept the unsaved androids, it's okay. <laughs> Glory to God. We are working on your deliverance, come on. 844-334-1191. I'm gonna tell you what word you're gonna send me. Text me right now, 844-334-1191 and you're gonna text the word feelings. That's all. Come on at home, I'm waiting on you. Text me, 844-334-1191, and you're gonna text the word feelings. You will receive a text message back. If it's an Android, it may take just a little bit longer, just a few more seconds, but you will get it back, I promise. It's going to hit your phone, and when you click on that, there is a feelings wheel that has all of these things. If you follow from the center all the way out, if you start with the high level of what you actually feel and then fan all the way out, it will give you language to use to better articulate your feelings. If you're gonna experience freedom, you gotta be, have self-awareness, you gotta seek God. How do I seek God? In prayer and preparation. You gotta know God's word and you gotta have a relationship with him that you talk to him. You're talking to everybody but God. Self-awareness, seek God. Seek constructive outlets. You need godly counsel. There's a difference in your friends and godly counsel. You need godly counsel. People around you who are strong believers, mature. How do I know that they're strong believers, they're mature? Check the fruit. 
You can't pull me out of the, the feeling of, of being impoverished in my spirit and you in the same hole that I'm in. Quit asking broke people how to make money. Stop asking broken people how to find a mate. Ooh, I'm preaching good right now to myself. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Godly counsel, journaling, watch this, spiritual coaching. You may have to go talk to a minister and it doesn't matter that it's me. I need to talk to my pastor. Mm -mm. Mm -mm, it's too many of y'all. No, no, I ain't even trying to be funny. It's really too many. Moses was doing the same thing and Jethro, his father-in-law, came and checked him and said, man, you can't do that, you're going to kill yourself. You, you have time for all of these families and then you'll be slothful in your own family. So get over the fact that it's got to be this pastor or this person. No, God will send you who you need to sit with. Okay, here's another one. Godly counsel. Maybe you need to be journaling. Spiritual coaching. This is the one. This is the one. Brace yourself. Clinical counseling. You want to learn how to manage and deal and master your feelings, you might have to go to talk to somebody who is professionally, clinically trained with the vocabulary, the tactics, and the teaching that you need in order to better handle your life. Are you with me? It, is not, it should not carry the same stigma that it is in our previous generations. It does not mean that you're crazy. It means that you are smart. You are wise. And then lastly is settlement and salvation. Seek God, seek constructive outlets, and find settlement and salvation. Seek to reconcile, seek to resolve. Seek to get to a place where you actually have peace of God that surpasses all understanding. It doesn't mean that you always will find the perfect outcome, but your feelings will not be so stuck in that place that you are resolved to always be miserable, always be hurting, always be wounded, always be a victim. You've got to move from victim to victor. And the only way to do that is through the salvation or the, the salvation of Jesus Christ. What do you mean? He will reach in and save you from yourself. He will reach in and pull you out of the funk or the depression that you're in and cause you to know that there is hope still, that I'm still God, I'm still sovereign. You, you don't believe it? Let me help you out. Just look back over your life at the times that you didn't think you were going to make it, that you thought you would be cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs by now, that you thought you would be walking backwards and singing sideways and by this point, that you thought you would never be able to heal from the hurt, you would never be able to get over the trauma, you would never be able to live, you would never have a smile again, you would never wave your hands. Go back and think about those things and just in case you did not know, it was Jesus that snatched you out of it, whether you realize it or not, it was the grace and the mercy of God that carried you when you didn't have feelings and emotion and mastery of your feelings enough to carry yourself. God did it. And the same God that did that will do this. And the same God that's doing this will do that. You just have to know that you must master your feelings. Are y'all with me? When Jesus was out on the water and the storm came up, the storm started raging. And he walks out on the water. He's on top of the storm. The very thing that was terrifying the, the disciples, he was walking on it. He said, I mastered this. As he comes out there, consumed with emotions. Fear is gripping them. They see a figure coming across the water in the middle of a storm. Imagine how you would feel. Wait a minute. What's that? What's that? You behind somebody else. What's that? No, John, you go see. No, you go see. No, I ain't going to see. I'm black. Walking over. Peter says, Jesus, it's me. Don't worry about it. If that's you, tell me to come. Terrified, emotions, fear, anxiety, stress, overwhelmed, overcome. Thinking about all the worst possible things. I'm going to die. 
It's a ghost. What is this? This is it for us. He finally says, okay, I gotta master this thing. I, re I recall the voice. I've heard the voice before. It's a familiar voice. It sounds like Jesus. If that's you, tell me to come. Because I know if you send your word, I'll be able to conquer these emotions. If your truth goes forth, then my emotions won't be so bad. If I hear from you, I will feel better. He had faith enough and sense enough, he had presence of mind, awareness enough to know that Jesus' voice, Jesus' words carried more weight than even the water. He says, come on. He steps out of the boat, not on his feet, but on his faith. Because he was not in his feelings, he was in his faith. His faith had not waned in that moment. And he found enough courage in God's voice, in Jesus' words, in truth, to conquer his emotions. But the wrestling match continues. Still went back and forth, still went back and forth. And right when he was walking in faith, a wave comes. Whoa! And immediately he takes his eyes off of Jesus. He takes his mind off of God's voice. Immediately he then cancels the promise. And he starts to sink. And Jesus grabs him. He said, why did you not believe? Oh, ye of little faith. What, what, what happened? Well, I know what happened. He got it in his... He went back into his feelings. And the moment he got in his feelings, and his feelings were more, more confident or more present, more prevalent than his faith, he started to sink. If you don't get out of your feelings, you're going to drown. If you don't conquer your feelings, your feelings are going to conquer you. If you don't master your feelings, then your feelings are going to become your master. How long do I have to be here before you believe? How long do I have to wake you up, give you breath, life, health, and strength? How long do I have to sustain you, provide for you? How long do I have to show you that I'll comfort you, I'll keep you, I'll hold you, I'll guard you, I'll protect you, I'll shield you, even from all the things that you are worried about, stressed about, full of anxiety? How long do I have to prove myself to you before you don't let your feelings cancel your faith? 